working in debug, but it essentially pulled out a word every rotation, which Did was they? 16 milliseconds. Are you on again? Yeah, okay. All right, so okay. Well, so why, why don't you begin with Frank? Yeah. So Frank that Press. just got a Frank Press was behind yeah. you and gave it here. And he, uh, he whispered to me, he says, could, could be, it could be uh, due to a certain uh, uh, theory which he uh, had thought on the spot, but actually th those wiggles were, uh, were not real. Uh, and that, by the way, exemplifies uh, some of the problems of any computation. The, sometimes the computer produces uh, things uh, which uh, are not real, that is, are, are irreproducible if the computer is more accurate. Uh, and the good computer, uh, a man like, for instance, uh, Igor Lakad, Dr. Igor Lakad, who, who did all the computing for me, by the way. Um, his faculty is was to sense something which didn't look good, mm -hmm. something which was slippery. Uh, he says, I can't accept this result. Uh, it's a terrific sense of, of, of judgment. And um, uh, seismograms, theoretical seismograms, was one of the applications. Of Had anybody theory. ever done it? Is that a term you made up, or was that a term? Yes, actually, the very first theoretical seismogram was published in 1948 by me, uh -huh. but that was done by longhand, a team of, of uh, hand cranking uh, computers, girl computers. Um, it was published by Columbia University uh, as a memoir of the Geological Society of America, 1948. And when that memoir fell into the hands of the Russians, after a while, they immediately set, translated it uh, into Russian, and it was in 1964, the first time I came to Moscow, uh, that the uh, young man who met me at the airport said, here is your book. <laughs> I didn't know of its existence. Uh, so I walked around with the book during uh, a week, we spent a week in, this was 64, mm -hmm. much later. Uh, walked around in Moscow, and finally I asked uh, uh, call the taxi and I say, take me to the publishing house, Nauka, which published this book. And I came in there, I say, I want royalty. <laughs> royalty, I want, I want to see the director. After a long wait, somebody came in, came out, and took me to the office, in which was sitting one man, didn't say a word, he said, sit down, and I sat down. Later came in a man who started talking. And my conclusion was he, they don't talk unless there's a witness. So, and this was a, an engineer who graduated from the Leningrad uh, uh, engineer, uh, electronic engineering department, a well-known uh, school uh, at that time. Uh, he spoke English well, and he explained to me that Russia is not in the habit of, play, of paying royalties. In exceptional occasions, they do so. And if you, if I insist, and I file an application, uh, he will see that this is discussed by the proper committee. So he said, give me paper. And right there and then, I wrote out in English uh, that I require uh, royalties for this book. And I asked him, will you please check that I identify the book properly? He did. This was in May 1964. Late in August, I received a letter in Russia. Your application for royalties. Oh, by the way, he tried to discourage me. He says, you know, even if you do give your royalties, you will, uh, they will be in rubles, and you can only use them in this country. So I said, I would like to have a charge account <laughs> in one of the banks in Moscow. Uh, so, uh, the letter said that your application was considered and the judgment is in the negative because the accounts of this book have been closed. <laughs> I asked the lawyer whether this is a, a legal argument. He said, no, not at all. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, I drifted from white side. Uh, anyhow, you, you call it, I see, okay. You're saying well, that term got international recognition, yeah. even in Russia. That's Just uh, the theoretical, the, uh, theoretical seismograph. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I may come back to it tomorrow when yeah. we discuss the Golan. Yeah. Because 
for the first time, the first product of gold, this was in May 1964, was a, uh, a theoretical cytogram, which was the first thing that he produced mm -hmm. was uh, the paper which I presented at, uh, later in Leningrad, a week later. Uh, going back to Weizsack, seismograms, and uh, then another activity was the nature of the, of the Earth, physical constitution of the Earth, especially how the Earth reacts if you hit it. Now, the, the Earth, poor Earth is hit by earthquakes uh, many times each day, uh, but it, in a sense, and it gives uh, records, ground vibrates, but it, it gives a little information as about its real nature. For the first time that the Earth started talking about itself was in uh, 1960, when there was the great Chilean earthquake. And uh, the records that were recorded by Frank Press, Louis Lichter, in fact, uh, by Marussi in Trieste, all over the world, uh, showed the natural frequencies of the Earth, how the, the blow was so strong that the Earth deformed itself into a football shape and kept on oscillating. Uh, uh, and we had spent, 1955, we had spent some five years figuring out what would happen if such a big blow uh, was, was, was received by the Earth. That is, we figured out the natural frequencies or the spectrum of the, of the globe of the Earth. And in the summer of 1960, there was an international conference in geophysics in Helsinki, in Finland. Uh, we came there, and Frank Press, Louis Lichter especially, came with records of the spec observed spectrum of the earthquake which happened a couple of months earlier uh, from the Chilean earthquake. And we presented our theoretical values and uh, uh, they presented their experimental values, values and the agreement was very good. That was one activity. At the same conference, I and, am, and you did that in 55 or 56? This was in 1960. So you did that on the golem or on the white side? No, no, white side. On white And um, at the same time, the golem didn't show up till 1964. Yes. The first exactly. thing I did on the golem, I, I published in, I spoke about in Leningrad in 1964, okay. four years later. Okay. Um, the other thing we did was to figure out the tides in the world oceans not just at one particular station on, on the coast, like Boston or San Francisco, but everywhere. Uh, and every uh, coastal station in the whole world, a task which was formulated by the French mathematician Massima Laplace, Marquis de Laplace, in 1775, and this was really approaching 200 years since he formulated, he set down equations is saying that if you can solve these equations and if you know the topography of the ocean, which is important, uh, the depth of the ocean varies from point to point, if you know the coastal shape and the topography of the ocean, then you can figure out what the tide should be. And we tried it. Uh, by 1960, Dishon and I uh, presented a paper at the same conference in which we announced that we uh, have shown that the solution of this problem is feasible. We didn't produce the final solution. And when I announced that, the um, dean of the Dorion of uh, Tidal Experts from Liverpool Tidal Observatory, Professor Proudman, got up and said, I thank God that I lived to hear this problem solved. That was in 1960. The actual solution uh, was uh, produced only in 1978, 18 years later, by Dr. Akkad. Um, and that was sold uh, mainly on, on the Golan. Um, the, the agreement in the final solution in 1978 
with the satisfactory. So, um, may I go back to what Jerry said, that when he came, people were, there was a party in my house and people were skeptical about the computer. Actively skeptical, yes. Actively skeptical. <laughs> and when the party wasn't in your house, it was even worse. Yeah. <laughs> now, as far as I remember, you mentioned a name, that was Professor Sidney Goldstein, mm -hmm. who came from Cambridge and took on a job in Technion after uh, World War II. He, uh, was the head, he took on a job as the head of the aeronautics department and uh, uh, later became president of the Technion. Uh, he now lives in, in Belmont, uh, retired. He was skeptical about computers. He thought that if you use computers, you uh, will be, you will not understand what the physical problem is. You will get results, but the, the, the whole purpose of, of applied mathematics is to do things without computers. That was his philosophy and he held to it. And I think because of that, you, the Technion, was late in, in introducing computers in the School of Engineering when, when it became uh, necessary, vital, of course, they, they did go ahead and spend the, and bought a computer. But he was one of those who thought and, uh, 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 that uh, the whole idea of, of spending time and thinking with the aid of computers was sort of a disgrace to the uh, to the reputation of applied mathematics. Uh, and from him, this skepticism, they all worked up on scene, all yeah. the skepticism. Well, Art, that's in your field, but then I remember Schlesniak and the other scientists here who were very jealous that you got so much money for the computer that they saw money out of their budgets. They also had no conception either of yeah, what the, a computer uh, could do. The Weissman <laughs> Institute, like any other academic institution, uh, Colleagues are jealous that mm -hmm. the other fellow is getting more, and so on. That's that's quite normal. Now the um, <clears throat> let me ask you one question. The other person computer. who was skeptical yeah. about computers was a non-scientist, but uh, an important figure in Israel. That was David Ben Gurion, Prime Minister, oh, for many years. Uh, he, uh, when he saw me, he would bring up the subject of, of computers right away. He bothered him. He says, a computer, a machine, can think, mm -hmm. and the implication is uh, it sort of disgraces the, the human dignity. Uh, uh, how can a machine uh, think? He has no feeling, or something like that, yeah? And it isn't that he just remarked that. This thing, or maybe this was a way of, of his uh, doing small talk, uh, or having some, some, some subject to talk to scientists. Whenever I met him, and not only I, later, Amos de Chalit told me that that was the question that he bothered him about. Skepticism about uh, computers. Now, when the computer started running, white said, it didn't take long before the people using it, and those were scientists in the Weizmann Institute, and especially uh, the great physicist of the Hebrew University, Julio Raka, would come down here every Thursday morning at 10 o'clock with a team of uh, assistants, and the computer would be put at his disposal, and it was only at 11.15 that he would show up to the weekly physics colloquium uh, at, at the Weizmann Institute. There was a tradition. Uh, he was solving, in those days, problems in complex uh, atomic spectra. And then economists started using it. We have an agricultural school, not in the White Minister, but across the street, a faculty of the Hebrew University. And they have economists, and they would come and work out their problems, how to plan crops, etc. And then the Treasury started using it. And so there was enormous pressure on us, but in Israel on Friday, just about an hour before sunset, we had to shut off Whitesack, and we could turn it on only uh, after three a darkness on Saturday night, after three stars could be identified in the sky. And these bothered me. And I started exploring the, what would be the attitude if we 
activated by itself over the weekend. Because stopping it in those days, uh, it isn't just the time loss, but getting the thing warmed up and stuff. Usually, the, 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 by stopping it and warming it up, uh, you, something went wrong. It was bad for its health. That's right. <coughs> so I was, had that thing in mind, and it got around that I'm considering operating the computer on Saturday, at which time Pina Rabinovich came over to me, who he said, if you do that, uh, I will draw the consequences. And the same I had with Frank Law, I remember, mm -hmm. afterwards, walked in, pale, and he said, I hear you're going to uh, operate a computer on Saturday. Well, without me, mm -hmm. I will leave you. Then... There wasn't Svi, there was Avi Ezri, Frank. Avi Ezri. Yeah. 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 He yeah. told us about it. Yeah, go ahead. We had a little bit, but go ahead. He didn't tell the same way. You were telling me. Yeah. <laughs> I sensed he didn't say he was going to say no, it. No, I saw, I saw the difficulty. Yeah. Then, the Polish government started letting out Jews from Poland, start, allowed them to emigrate to Israel, and they were coming in uh, considerable numbers. The Jewish agency the, would uh, offer the Weizmann Institute to pay the salary of a new scientific scientist for about three years, a temporary appointment, in order to allow these people to get adjusted. And so there was a uh, four months like that. People would come in with a yellow sheet, the name is stated from the agency, uh, and I would sit and, and uh, we took some of them. One day a man comes in, Frankowski, the name is, uh, he looked blonde, and I say, he's a mathematician. He says, I, I studied mathematics in, uh, in, in uh, Warsaw, and then I was sent on a fellowship to, to Moscow. Uh, I say, uh, could you operate the computer? This is not doing computing. But Was he Jewish? Just a minute. Okay. <laughs> what else, you know? yeah. uh, could you operate it? So I say, you have a job. And he worked for some time. Uh, but the, uh, his appearance, very blonde. And so the ne next day, I looked up his, uh, the yellow sheet he gave me. And I see his first name is Christoph. I mean, Christoph is what I, I pronounce it, but it was spelled in Polish. And the Polish can pack in a name like Christoph about a dozen Z's. <laughs> Christoph or something like that. <laughs> so I have a Christoph on my staff. So I call in after some time, Pankowski, and I say, could you operate the computer for 26 hours? 27 hours, uh, from sunset on Friday until, I mean, just be alone, there will be nobody around you, you stand there and operate white side. Uh, he says, yes, of course, when I was a student, I worked uh, uh, in a factory, 48 hours in succession. So I say, if you do this, 26 hours a week instead of 48, uh, then the rest of the week you don't have to do anything. He said, that would be fun. So then I call in this Pini Rabinovich, the uh, chief programmer, the one who gave us uh, courses for programming. Uh, and I say, go to the rabbi of Rehobot, Rabbi Meltzer, and tell him that I am asking him to send me three elderly people who for eight and a half hours will get a week's salary. And their job will be to come at sunset, the three shifts, to come at sunset to the uh, our computer and sit in the room and watch that no Jew enters it. Pina Avanovich came back and he says, yes, Rabbi is uh, gladly send you, three people. So on the first day, the idea was, of course, if, if I came in, or any other one came in, of course, the, the religious people would say, we are, we are operating a computer on Saturday. Mm -hmm. So the whole duty of these guards was to make sure that no Jew comes in town. So an old uh, man could hardly drag his, his legs came in, and I say, here's your couch, and here's your job. You stay here for eight and a half hours. But he's hours. a Jew. He's a Jew. Well, how yeah. can he work as he a was God? Sent, he he was, was sent. Right. This is the rabbi's business. That's the right. Rabbi <laughs> sent him. Yeah. The rabbi sent him. Yeah. 
and uh, uh, your, your journey is until your, your pal will come in eight and a half years, uh, hours later, uh, and your journey is to see that no Jew works. So, and of course, I wanted to see what was happening, what happens if, if, some, if, if Frankowski collapses. Mm -hmm. uh, I was worried about it. Or he wants to get a drink of water. <clears throat> uh, this, the guards could bring him, of course. Uh, when I saw three stars, I ran to the computer and I said, I said, Frankowski, are you still alive? Yes, it went off. And so it went. We were operating the computer on Saturday. Then we have a union of guards at the Weizmann Institute. They receive a telephone call. They want the, the uh, leader of the union, the president of the union, wants to meet with me. He comes in and he says, look, we have a complaint to file. Uh, we hear that a, uh, what is considered in our eyes a soft job has uh, uh, become available at the Weizmann Institute. You go ahead and you call in outsiders without consulting our union. It's against our contract. A job like this, where you don't have to walk in the rain, you see inside <coughs> all the time. It's on Saturday where you get paid uh, double or triple. Uh, he says that is a uh, good thing for us. <clears throat> so I told him I will give you an answer. Then I started thinking and I said, this may not be such a bad development. Mm -hmm. And I call him, I say, Peter Abinovich, and I say, uh, the union of gods was here. I don't know anything about labor relations. Maybe you talk to him. So Pinya talked to him and he realized that and it didn't take long before our own guards took over. And when that happened, I could feel free to come in and after a while the opposition of the religious people uh, sort of faded out because they had it all in their hands. I did what, what they wanted. I used the man that the, the, the rabbi of the city uh, uh, sent. Uh, so what else could I do? And it was accepted. Uh, they didn't like it, but uh, they wouldn't come in. Of course, yeah. But then uh, people in Jerusalem and the treasury heard about it. And whenever Friday morning I would sit and tell them, would ring, can you give me a, a couple of hours of computing over the weekend? Because over the weekend the demand was uh, small. And I remember one day I get a telephone call from a man by the name of Franco. I think he was an uncle of a Franco. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. He says to me, Professor Peckers, I work in the treasury. And um, I just heard that my neighbor here has got some hours of computing. On the, and he told you that the reason why he has to do it on, on this Saturday is because the budget has to be presented on Sunday at the government uh, meeting. Uh, I am telling you that presenting a budget is not legally a matter of life and death. And therefore, it's forbidden to, mm -hmm. to use a computer on Saturday. Uh, I didn't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's the way one problem about Weizsäck was solved. Now, going to 1960... Was Frankowski Jewish? <clears throat> no, he wasn't. Of course he was not. So I asked him, how, I asked Frankowski how... How did he get out of Poland? How did he come to <coughs> Israel? He says, my wife is Jewish. Okay. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, we've heard his, all his wives huh? are Jewish. Somebody said all his wives are Jewish. All his wives? Yeah. That he married, married another, another person. Yeah. Yeah. Then, in the summer of 1961, uh, oh yeah, then we... we uh, Akkad was uh, operating, uh, programming, and we tackled a very difficult problem in physics, and that is to solve the Schrodinger wave equation for two electron atoms. For one electron, Schrodinger himself solved in 1926, and for two electrons, there were approximate solutions by Hila Ross and Chandra Sekhar, the astronomer. But the um, uh, in those days, the lamp shift was discovered, Professor Lamp, and that required to explain the lamp shift, to determine its magnitude and compare the magnitude with, with the theory, uh, we had to have more accurate uh, solutions. 
uh, then the, and, and the experimentalists were improving their techniques all the time, so that in, uh, in those years the uh, experimentalists were way ahead in accuracy of uh, uh, in spectroscopy <laughs> than the theoreticians because it's so difficult to solve the Schrodinger equation for more than one electron. In the case of hydrogen, one electron you can solve it very exactly. Uh, and there was a professor Hertzberg in Ottawa. He kept on refining the uh, uh, value of the uh, term value of the ground state of helium. Helium is a two electron atom. And his experimental accuracy exceeded by far the theoretical accuracy. I developed a method by which it was possible, a new approach to the mathematical approach, uh, by which it was possible, and then Akka put it on Whitehead, and we got results which, for the first time, were more accurate than the experimental values. Was that the time Whitehead ran for 80 hours? Or was it with that problem? No, 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 that was another one, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Eight hours was with gold. Oh, oh. Yeah. So, um, in 67, yeah? I see. Yeah. So, um, I mean, the first paper which I published in 1958, finished in 1957, uh, gave the answer to the helium atom and all other atoms of two electrons, ionized atoms, so called. Uh, and the jump in accuracy was so great uh, that even to this day, that 1957 paper is, is a classic. Uh, the accuracy there has not been exceeded. Hey, um, let me ask you one more question. Yeah? Because the, the greatest difficulty in use of the computer is in modeling. Now, one of the things that was explained to me about your, your work is that many other people have really taken their equations, which they had evolved without thinking about computing, and gone ahead and tried to do the calculations. But one of the things that was said to me that you started back and you formulated your models for calculation very much with the computation in mind. Now, is this a meaningful, you know, statement? Well, in this specific case, uh, it's not quite what you're saying. Uh -huh. In this specific case, uh, had I used the, uh, the mathematical approach of uh, previous people, the variational method, I don't know how far we could get, but I devised a new method by using a different set of coordinates, if that's a model, yes, yeah? yes, yes. yes. Then that but it was with computation in mind, I don't think, oh, yeah. you, have, you wouldn't yes. have chosen those coordinates if you didn't have the, right. your computer. With those yes. coordinates, yes. and that worked <laughs> like uh, mm -hmm. marvelous. Then in the summer of 1961, I remember I was writing a paper on uh, two electron atoms, and the president <coughs> of uh, Brown University, Barnaby Keeney came in. Uh, we were both fellows of the Guggenheim Foundation in 1948, I think. So uh, uh, he sort of was a pal of mine and came to Israel. How goes it? I said to him, uh, well, Weizsäck is turning out results so fast I can, ha I can hardly uh, uh, have the time to write them up. He says, Chaim, don't worry. In a short while, uh, Weizsäck will himself write the papers, and uh, another computer will review them. <laughs> and uh, we then started working on lithium plus. This is a, uh, a two electron atom, different from helium. Um, and there too, the ground state agreed very well with experiment, but the excited state, for the first time, showed a discrepancy with our theoretical results. And it's not just a small discrepancy. Um, the discrepancy was enormous. And Hertzberg kept on improving the accuracy of his uh, uh, 
experimental techniques, and he published uh, a term value for this uh, lithium plus, uh, where, uh, to put it uh, simply, the wavelength he was measuring was 8500. My answer came out 9500, a thousand <coughs> angstroms different, which is enormous. And uh, Hertzberg was working on, on a tenth of, of an angstrom. Uh, but there was a question of 1,000. So I wrote to Hertzberg, your ground state agrees perfectly with, with, with my calculations, but the uh, first excited state of lithium flats is way off. So, and then I said, in case that the line that you measured is a misidentification, that he was measuring some other line, could you please uh, look at 9,500 angstroms mm -hmm. and see if you find a line from lithium plus. His answer was, no, I can't because my plates are with difficulty sensitive enough at 8,500, but at 9,500 they are completely insensitive. So I wrote to a professor Rand in Pennsylvania State College and I told him the story and I asked him, would you look at 9,500 and see if there is a lithium plus line? He says, he answered, I'll let you do it. But uh, I don't have the source. I wrote, reported to Hertzberg and uh, I dictated a letter one evening to Hertzberg in Ottawa saying, will you please send your source from Ottawa to Professor Rand at Pennsylvania State College who is going to measure uh, this one. <coughs> Next morning I came, I read this letter and I decided that matters are getting out of hand. I'm sitting at the hall, <laughs> and I'm writing to Hertzberg to send a source, Hertzberg in Ottawa, to send a source to Rand in Pennsylvania State College. Oh yes, Hertzberg goes on to say, in his reply, he says, by the way, all I did in my measurements was to improve a measurement made by Ceres and Wheelies in Oxford University. They measured it some uh, 10 years before me and I just improved the accuracy. So the question of identification, I took their identification. <laughs> so I looked up Sears and Wheelies. They also didn't uh, produce the identification. They based their identification on an experiment carried out in Niels Bohr's Institute in 1926 by Werner. So Sears and Wheelies took the identification from Werner and uh, uh, Herzberg took, accepted the identification, but he perfected it more accurately. So I thought, I'm writing to, to Rand, I'm writing to Herzberg to send a source to, to Rand in Pennsylvania State College to check the identification of a line made by Sears and Village in Oxford, who based their results on an experiment carried out in 1926. Uh, that's a little bit out of hand, and I sent in the manuscript in the summer of 1971, 61. In the fall of 1962, I got a reprint of a paper by a famous spectroscopist, Ed Len, in Lund <coughs> University in Sweden. Ed Len and Torso, in the fall of 1962, a year later, that they had looked, the minute they read the paper, uh, when it was published. I sent it in the summer of 61. It must have appeared half a year later. They read it. And anyway, they set to look for the 9500 line and they found it and the term value which they computed agrees exactly in their own words with uh, my theoretical uh, prediction. So... Um, that's beautiful applied mathematics. Oh yeah. yeah. But <coughs> this one thing still bothered me. I wrote to Goudsmith, who was then the editor of the Physical Review, and I say it's all very well, but uh, what was this line <laughs> which Werner measured? By the way, <laughs> I, when I looked up the literature, I found that Werner, in his doctor's thesis, which he published in 1926 in, in uh, Danish, retracted this identification. Mm -hmm. But Sears and Willis, Willis were not aware of it because one doesn't read the Dutch publications, yeah? <laughs> Proceedings of the Dutch Academy of Science. Uh, so, but it worried it, it, it war me. What was this line that, that Werner measured and Sears and Willis? And, mm -hmm. and I wrote to my, my worry to 
My concern to the editor Gaussman, and Gaussman uh, wrote back, I still have the letter. If you knew how many lines, spectral lines, exist which will never identify, <laughs> you wouldn't worry. <laughs> Did you know? Did you know Gaussman? Did yes, you, I met him. Did you know his role? His role during World War II uh, in the so-called Alsace mission? Yes. You, you're the first person I met about that. <laughs> Did he tell you? About yeah, he was. No, I didn't talk to him after the Alsace mission, but he came to MIT uh, at the very first days of the radiation lab. He, he came, and um, he and Ullenbeck came. Uh, to work on this uh, radar development. I remember he gave a talk in Harvard on statistics. He was an expert on statistics. And uh, I told him that uh, a uh, German geophysicist, Bartel, uh, has determined the lunar tide in the Earth's atmosphere. There's a tide in the, in the Earth's uh -huh. atmosphere, uh, solar and lunar, and he determined the lunar tide, which is, uh, and the solar tide, yeah? The solar tide in the Earth's atmosphere is stronger than the lunar tide. That presented a problem. And he measured it by taking 65 years old, a collection of 65 hourly observations, years of hourly observations. And he uh, dug it out by statistical method. He dug it out from uh, the amplitude. Now, the difficulty, which I uh, pointed out to the government, is that the thickness, the, the, the amplitude of the, uh, of, the loop of the solar tide in the Earth's atmosphere is just a fraction of a millimeter. And the thickness of the line, of the barometer, measuring the Earth, is just about that. So, but with the one of the square root of n law, uh, theoretically, should be possible. <coughs> he says, "Tell that Nazi faker that I don't accept his his <laughs> results." This was in 1940 or 41. When did we enter the, the war? 1941. The radiation lab, I think, was formed before that. Yeah. 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 But still, I don't. I, at this point, uh, huh? did you work at the radiation? No. Oh my. Oh. Uh, I worked uh, later at Columbia University's uh, Division of War Research and we had contact with uh, We worked on radar problems. You uh, worked on radar problems? Well, uh, how the atmosphere uh -huh. affects uh, radar propagation. And at lunch you were telling me about, might as well go back a little bit because we don't have anything on the tape. You said you entered MIT in 1926 and we never got to you graduating and what you did between 1926 and why don't you just go over there? Oh, I entered in 1926. I graduated from high school in uh, Hebrew High School in Kopno, Kaunas, capital of Lithuania, in 1924. Then I spent two years as a uh, public school teacher and collected enough money to uh, go to the States. And I wrote to my uncle, Max Baker, in Springfield, Massachusetts. I sent him an application to be admitted to School of Engineering in Boston. From there, the North Village where I was, my uncle was near Springfield, near Boston. There was a Boston University, so I wrote to the Department of Engineering at Boston University. Boston University at that time didn't have any engineering school, so they sent over my application to, to MIT. And I got a letter from MIT, I didn't know the existence of MIT, saying, if you want to be admitted to MIT, then you have to, we don't admit students without uh, entrance examinations. That was true then. Uh, you have to take exams. Uh, we will be glad to give you an examination if you come to, to us and take the exam, or go to Geneva, where we hold examinations to foreign students every year. So I went back, I just, Spent two years collecting money for a ticket. <laughs> I cannot go neither to the United States nor to <laughs> Geneva, but there is a, an American consul in uh, Kaunas, capital of Lithuania. Send your, your questionnaire 
through examination papers, send it to the council and tell him this is going to be a secret thing. He would open the envelope in my presence and he would sit while I answer the questions uh, and he would close it and send it back. And that's what happened. And I was admitted to MIT in 1926. You learned English in Estonia? What? You learned English in Lithuania? In Lithuania. Where did you learn English? Where did you learn English? Letter was in Lithuania. In one of the villages where I taught one year, there was a copy of the Saturday Evening Post. <laughs> one of the issues. And somebody also had a Yiddish English dictionary. So I started learning English from that. I studied Western stories. I remember the whole thing was so strange. <laughs> I dug it up. And uh, when I entered MIT, I, I, one of the, the, I had to take a course in, in uh, general history. And I remember there was a textbook by Moore, somebody in, in uh, Columbia. And the, uh, on the side of the pages were all translations of in Yiddish. <laughs> and I remember the second semester, freshman, 1926-27, uh, we had a, a, a school, a, a course in public speaking. Uh, Green was the teacher. And uh, so I had to prepare a speech. And I remember my speech was Tolstoy, Freud and Dostoevsky. <laughs> MIT. At MIT. Yeah. I come with a prepared speech. And my classmates come. And one man gets up and he says, to what was Lincoln's speech? Four score, huh? four, four score and four score and, and seven years ago. ago. Four score and seven years ago. He ran off, rattled off the, the, the Lincoln speech. And I was impressed. It was, didn't know the <laughs> He didn't know the origin. <laughs> then the second one comes up and starts up four scores and seven years ago. It's the same speech. All of them. Just memorized. It. <laughs> and then Professor Green announces uh, Pekarish is going to talk on Tolstoy, Dostoevsky. <laughs> 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 Uh, when I was finished, Green asked me, I, have you always been interested in these subjects? <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, the course at MIT at that time, I think still now, took four years. For some reason, I decided to finish it in, in three years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did. What were you, what course was it in math, applied mathematics? Or? Well, I started out in electrical engineering, mm -hmm. actually, yeah. And I learned how to make, uh, uh, how to design motors. Generate and so on. I came as a student and uh, I got permission from the Lithuanian authorities to postpone my military service until I was finished. <coughs> and, uh, but I made it in three years. In and after the, after the first term, I already got a fellowship. And I remember the thing that surprised me I was awarded a Baker Fellowship. And the Baker Fellowship must still exist at MIT. Mm -hmm. And it was such a surprise to me. The American government takes a foreign student, a visitor, and gives him, I mean, not the American government, the American institution, yeah, and gives him a fellowship. In Lithuania, it was unthinkable. A Jew would get a fellowship. Uh, anyway, uh, from after the first to freshman year, I didn't have to pay any tuition. And when I uh, uh, did it in three years, I remember I walked into the person. MIT and I say, uh, you owe me six hundred dollars. You would have had to give me a, uh, another year, another uh, another year of a fellowship. Yeah? <laughs> and at that time, the um, Guggenheims, the owners of copper mines in mm -hmm. South America, yeah? they were concerned about the backwardness of aeronautical engineering in the United States. <coughs> And they did something. They uh, gave MIT, they built a, a Guggenheim aeronautical building at MIT, 
and they did so in, in, in Caltech as well, in several uh, NYU yeah. universities, yeah. And and by you did you say? Yeah. 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 And they brought from Theodore von Kármán to uh, Caltech. That was part of the program. And they also announced a fellowship, uh, two thousand dollars, to study uh, meteorology. Uh -huh. uh, so I applied and, and, and I won that. They cut it down to 1,000, but anyway, that was uh, quite a fellowship. Result. And that was the beginning of the Depression. Yeah. That was 29, that 26, was 29. 29. Yeah. So, but did you get your bachelor's in electrical engineering or did you switch no, to math? No, I switched to mathematics. I did it in potential theory under Professor Franklin, but I didn't stay long there. I got, uh, I then switched to meteorology, I got my PhD in uh, meteorology. Mm -hmm. What's left it? Huh? No, well, the last B. Oh, the Well, where's left come into the picture? You were always After talking about I it as your got professor. my degree on the last B, the Slifter came to MIT. That happened oh, so in the then later. you were a postdoc. Then, I, then I, I moved to. No. I see. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, I remember <clears throat> I, when I finished up to the third year, I still had. They gave a course in economics, X31 and X32. I did. I took X, X31. I remember a Yankee professor. Forget it. Yeah. And uh, when it came to taking the second course, second term, uh, I walked into this professor and I say, uh, "I'm rather busy these days." <laughs> Would you mind if I show up and take the exam on your course? He says, I don't mind, but you go you go to the dean. If it's okay with him, then it's okay with me. So I come to the dean and request permission to take the exam. Mm -hmm. I say the professor of economics uh, uh, agrees. agrees. He says, what is the reason that you don't want to take the course? Why not to take the course? I say, uh, I would have to pay for tuition or something like that. Mm -hmm. He says, what did your name be? He says, Peccaris. Name sounds familiar. Didn't you just get a thousand dollar fellowship? <laughs> <laughs> you got caught. <clears throat> did he let you do it? Did he uh, agree? No, no. I was... I, 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 Appear and register and, <laughs> and take the course and go through all Now, that. during my third year, there was a uh, professor of steam engineering, and he, uh, he gave me a part time job correcting his papers, his examination papers. That was uh, my income. And I would sit over the weekend and correct all the uh, exams. Um, and then I uh, asked him to give me a letter to the immigration authorities in Canada saying that I worked as his assistant for two years. It's true. I worked as his assistant. So I went, I left the United States to cross the border to Canada. I appeared before the consul in Montreal and I said, um, <clears throat> I want a visa and uh, you had to wait for your quota yeah. normally, yeah? And that would have meant... You quoted to come back to the United States. Yeah. yeah. Uh, first of all, you have to leave the country, which I did. I was in Canada. But the Lithuanian, I had a Lithuanian passport. With a Lithuanian passport, the quota was, was occupied for 10 years or something yeah. like that. But they had a, a special cat category, I think it was category 4H, for clergymen who are admitted, or professors, or people essential for the, the industry of the United okay. States. And I came in with a letter, I said I was uh, an assistant to professor of steam engineering at MIT, and I want a uh, he smiled and gave me a visit. <laughs> That's the way I came. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, I would have to go back to, to Lithuania and serve the army and get off. And, and what did you do during the thirties before? Oh, uh, uh, where did you work? There was the Rockefeller Foundation had an educational fund, and in 1936, I won a, a Rockefeller Fellowship. And by the way, all physicists, all leading physicists in the United States were Rockefeller Fellows, mm -hmm. Slate, uh, whoever counted. This was a branch of the uh, Rockefeller Foundation uh, in other fields. And I, was, I went to 
Cambridge to study geophysics with uh, Harold Jeffries. And I was 36, 37. And uh, I remember on Thanksgiving's Day of 1937, uh, the Cambridge University invited all American students for a Thanksgiving dinner, given in St. John's College. And each guest had a, a, a important person to entertain him. My entertainer was Sir Arthur Eddington. Uh, he being a Quaker, he started telling the stories. <coughs> anyway, uh, but it was a rather nice thing. Uh, one of your, one of the students at that time was the son of Millikan, who I think was a professor at MIT in mm -hmm. economics, yes, right? Yeah, yeah. Was he was one of the founders of the political science yeah. Yeah. And I got into the spirit of Cambridge, uh, there was a problem of why the solar tide in the atmosphere is bigger than the lunar. Just the opposite of what it is in the, mm -hmm. the ocean, you know? And uh, there was a suspicion and that the atmosphere may have a free a frequency. Maybe it's a case of resonance with the solar tide, which is a different period from the lunar tide. There was a controversy going on between uh, uh, Chapman, a member of John's College in Cambridge, but teaching at the Imperial College, and Sir Jeffrey Taylor, who was a professor of Cam at Cavendish Laboratory. Great, uh, great, uh, high, uh, Animation. Now these people get together once a month where they drink and uh, festive dinner. They certainly have a plenty of occasion to meet, but um, they were writing papers against each other in the proceedings of the Royal Society. And I came there and I established contact with Chapman. I used to come there uh, quite often. And I found an answer that both are right, that the atmosphere Oh yeah, the argument of J.I. Taylor was that the Krakatau explosion, you know, which threw a lot, yeah, a lot of dust in the air, that the wave from there, one of the beautiful papers which J.I. Taylor wrote, the wave from there propagated in such speed, showing that the atmosphere has a resonance of ten and a half hours, not twelve hours exactly. So, Taylor was against the resonance theory because the, the, it has no resonance at twelve hours. Whereas Chapman, who collected the data, uh -huh. uh, he, he uh, was sure, and I found that the, if you take into consideration, this was in 1937, where all, all we knew about the, uh, the atmospheric structure is, is what could be reached by balloons or by airplanes, up to five kilometers, eight kilometers, uh, but we never penetrated the stratosphere. And I showed that if you assume that at the height of 35 kilometers above the Earth, the temperature, instead of being constant, as it is between 10 and 35, started to rise, rise instead of falling, yeah? Then the atmosphere will have exactly 10 and a half hours and period. Yeah. And the argument, that convinced people for, for a decade or so, but uh, uh, the arguments went on, uh, people wrote books on this subject, it's still an open, an open How did you get interested in meteorology? What? How did you get interested in meteorology? And then maybe we'll take a break. Yeah. Who, uh, meteorology, I told you. I, because he had a fellow, they were giving a fellow. Because <laughs> giving, I had a choice, either to go and serve in the Lithuanian army. You didn't have like a particular or, interest. Or, or instead of physics, to study now. meteorology. Yeah. Right. And that was it. I mean, as well, we you know, when you were a child, interested in the weather, or... When Ooh, you were a child. Not particularly, yeah. Not particularly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I heard you say that, but I thought... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, got, I have a PhD in... Uh, oh, a Doctor of Science, excuse me. Yeah. In meteorology. So then there's a period from 37 to... When did... When did yeah, when to the 40s, I, mean. I guess, yeah. yeah. You want to take a break? Yeah, then I... While well, I was in Cambridge, I got an appointment as a research associate at, uh, at MIT. I came back. And, uh, and who we, were you working with? Rich Lifter. Rich Lifter, yeah. Lifter, yeah. Oh, so that's what yeah. And uh, then in... Uh, and the war? Who the only war, war? Slifter, when... After the Blitz, Slifter was very pro-English, immediately started doing the type of, of things that he researched on in World War I. Uh, propagation of sound in the ocean. Uh -huh. 
and uh, we started doing experiments in theory in MIT, and after Pearl Harbor, we moved to Columbia, the whole group moved to Columbia University to begin the research, where the uh, oh, underwater so acoustics... Oh, so you were still part of his group when you did that. Did sonar okay. come out of that group? What? Did sonar come out of that group? Sonar, sonar. system. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's where the sonar system was developed. Yeah. Uh, so uh, after a while, I was the, became the head of the mathematical physics group of Columbia University's Division of Water Research. Mm -hmm. Did you use the differential analyzer at MIT? Uh, differential analyzer was at MIT, but towards the end of the war, in '43 or so, they told us that we can make use of a computer in the Bell Telephone Laboratories downtown in New York. And I went down there. It was a relay machine. And I remember I read the manual yeah, of, right. of that machine. And the thing that surprised me was that this machine can knows only one or two things. It can be either on or off, or a relay can be closed or, or open. And with this thinking capacity, it can do the complicated. That was the, the only time that the, the, the substance of computers uh, had an impact on me. <laughs> Um, and we used it for, for computing until the war was over. Uh, I, was, I was coming in and out there. When the war was, was over, I remember I called up and I said, would you allow me uh, to use the computer again? I'm still at Columbia University. Our mathematical physics scope was not mm -hmm. disbanded. Then I got a contact with the O&R office and they were search to continue this uh, uh, what we were doing then was, was, as I said before, the propagation of radar waves. Mm -hmm. That was continued by the Office of Naval Research. <clears throat> Peoria was then an official of all oh, oh, right. yeah. 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 And um, this is just a minute. This is the man at Bell Labs. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I hear there are three people on the phone. And it says, Dr. Pickers, <clears throat> you should know that the war is over. And our, uh, we offered in facilities uh, where the war was on, but now it was a different situation yeah. and we can't do it. So I said, would you mind if I just come in for a little while? He says, this is a sort of a request I, we, I was afraid of. <laughs> and I said, <"It's> no. <laughs> do you recall, um, at that time, when you with that relay machine, did you take yourself as far as understanding how they did arithmetic, or it wasn't that uh, when you looked well, at the manual? No, no. How, how they did uh, hardware-wise. Uh, yes, yeah. The relays, how they manage with the ones and zeros to do arithmetic. Well, no. No. I, I it just, just, I just was enough that they're to, working uh, on a binary system. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But how they they do addition and how the yeah things like that that uh, never. Totally not interested. Wasn't interested in the computer. Oh, no, that's right. No, I understand. But I sometimes, system. you know, with people, you I, I, uh, you I, might have gone done that once, computer, and then with the computer was a tool. Right, right. Yeah. of course. Yeah. No, no, no question. But um, you, you're yeah. intrigued. You still, I notice about you that that you remember the simple. You everything you do, you like to break it down into the simplest, and that probably that you could do all of this complicated thing by just. That probably I could uh, I intrigue um, you. Uh, by the time I understand something, it has to be simple. Well, uh, okay. yeah, yeah. Th there was so this. You this didn't have any reason to use a differential analyzer at MIT or the or, or the Columbia didn't have a differential analyzer. They had a uh, difference uh, machine. Yeah, I think I once used the, the differential analyzer at MIT. One development of it was to uh, solve integral equations mm -hmm. with the aid of photography. Aid of photography? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I wrote a paper having to do, I solved one problem on, uh -huh. on, on one integral equation. I solved one on mm -hmm. that. Had, had you met uh, uh, Vanna Bush or Claude Shannon? What? Did you meet Bush when you were there? Vanna Bush, Bush or Claude Shannon? Claude yeah. Shannon. Vanna Bush. Star of MIT uh, at that time developed that. And I remember the the, the the functional analyzer of MIT was uh, an exhibit. Crowds would come in. 
I remember one day Norbert Wiener was explaining the computer to some engineers, I think from General Electric. And while he was doing it, he was not a great popularizer, by the way. <coughs> Uh, while I was doing it, I heard one of the engineers say to the other, I bet you if this man were out of MIT, he wouldn't find a job. <laughs> <laughs> one thing, given your connections with MIT, Chaim, how come the issue of reproducing the whirlwind computer didn't, didn't arise? That was going on roughly the same time. Well, there were all sorts of, of uh, projects which were being put to me <coughs> in the course of years. Uh, tending to deviate me from Weizsäcker <laughs> and from Gold. For instance, while Weizsäcker was being built, uh, the National Research Council of Israel, yeah. headed by Sambulski, sent me a memorandum and says, you don't have to build a computer in Palestine or in Israel because the United Nations is sending up a computing center in Rome. Yes. And all the Mediterranean countries can send our problems by mail and get the answer. Now, what they had, I think they ordered something called the Mercury. Um, the Mercury. Ferranti. Huh? Ferranti. Ferranti. That's right, yes. Do you, you remember the, the year? No, no, no. Anyway. That's some that, years later. Huh? That computer. Very little actual computation That's right. Oh, but That's imagine right. if we gave this up, yeah? <laughs> yeah. But well, Whirlwind was about the same stage as... Yeah, but von Neumann invited him yeah. to the Institute. Uh -huh. And he was certainly a much more advanced yes. machine. Yes, that's Neumann. right. Von Neumann was the applied, the applied mathematician who wanted a machine, so... I must have come to the Institute for Advanced Study uh, in 1946. Well, I know when I came here in May '46, I came from the Institute for Advanced mm -hmm. Study. So at the end of '45, yeah, the end of '45. Okay, let's see. Are there any issues? Oh, I think there? it's clear. May I tell you something about Oppenheimer's connection with the White Swan Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Would that Please. be yeah, that yes, absolutely. very well? Uh, since I was working with von Neumann, Oppenheimer as the director of the Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, was very polite, uh, like he like his attitude to other members of the of my group. Yeah. And when asked to uh, become a member of the advisory committee, he accepted that. And uh, my wife and Kitty became friends. Mm -hmm. In fact, she helped uh, yeah. some problem with one of the children. Uh, and when in '48 we decided to leave, there was a send-off party in the house of the director. And Kitty burst up, "Why are you going?" Mm -hmm. And I think Niels Bohr was there, and it was so noisy <laughs> uh, that Oppenheimer uh, turned to me, "Hein," he said, "What do you say?" So, because it was uh, war. War was going on, yes. <coughs> and I stupidly said, "I have insurance." against uh, personal damage <laughs> in Palestine or something like that. But then Niels Bohr took an interest in the Weizmann Institute, accepted an invitation, and he came here for the dedication of the Physics Institute. And he, as a matter of fact, he stayed two weeks in my house. When was that? In 1957. Okay. Then he stayed, came another time, and he... Um, stayed in my house again, became friends, and I learned to understand his, uh, his talk. <laughs> yes. uh, and of course, not being a physicist, I, uh, I do, did remember I was working on Boltzmann's integral equation in statistics, and I remember that Niels Bohr and his doctor's thesis, uh, uh, the theme was, in 1913, the theme was uh, uh, statistical treatment of electrons in a metal. So I asked him, you remember your doctor's thesis? That started an avalanche which lasted for three, two weeks. He remembered everything and he was explaining it to me. It took me some time to I understood that. And then he told me about his experiences with atomic bomb and his uh, letter to Churchill, which mm -hmm. he showed me and all that. And when Heisenberg's Autobiography came out. 
I thought if I, at that time, when Niels Bohr was in my house, if I had written down whatever, because Heisenberg goes ahead and writes pages upon pages, what, what Niels Bohr said to him in 1937. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering how could Heisenberg remember what Niels Bohr said? If I had written that down, that would have been uh, <laughs> worthwhile. Mm -hmm. But uh, going back to Oppenheimer, when Oppenheimer heard that Niels Bohr came to the White Finance Institute. Then and only then did he start uh, a personal interest in the, in, in the White Finance Institute. And I remember his last visit here, I think in the spring of 1966. He was, he was a member of the board. Mm -hmm. And I remember at one meeting, he came twice or three times. In one meeting, there was a discussion to sell some land which we had across the railway here, railway tracks to an industrial uh, city, yeah? Mm -hmm. <coughs> every, every industrial park. It was a board meeting, yeah? yeah? Everybody raised their hands for it, except him. He, he was objected to sell, selling institute property mm -hmm. to an out, out, out In 1966, I was sitting next to him for most of the meals here in San Martin, mm -hmm. and I noticed that he fully given to him, he hardly touches it, he hardly ate. And before he left, he says, uh, I'm coming to New York, and I don't go back to Princeton in New York, I will, uh, I get a checkup, my regular checkup mm -hmm. at the uh, New York hospital. So I, I didn't know, uh, neither did he know at that time that he was uh, very fatally sick, or you know, something in his throat. Mm -hmm. And I remember there was a Friday evening, uh, he was uh, at Weisgold's house. Uh, he was a bit bored. Mm -hmm. uh, one uh, uh, lady VIP who was put next to him. And as he walked out, uh, we passed my house. I took him to from the uh, president's house. Mm -hmm. uh, occupied by Michael Seller, took him to San Martin, he passed my house, he says, well, gone are the days when we had dinner in your house with Niels Bohr. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. uh, if it weren't for Niels Bohr, I wonder whether he would have accepted membership uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, as a governor. Well, it has nothing to do with the history of it. Yeah, well, well, it's all these people. Uh, were, so let, let's like, finish like, by it. What? would have happened, do you think, if you uh, would have had a computer five years later, or you would have bought a commercial computer in yeah, the early yeah. 60s when you... Many say that the IBM computer would have eventually come here, you know, as it did. Yeah. Do you think somebody certainly, would have solved the problem? Certainly my, my work would, would not have developed the way, the way it did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you had dreams of the computer industry starting here too. I mean, you hoped that that. In, in a sense, I had a private computer. I mm -hmm. was the man who handed out the time. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the uh, benefits of running a computer, in fact, the only computer in the country, one of the benefits was when something went wrong and, and, and a customer couldn't come. That was my. <laughs> that's on, my your, yeah, your, yeah. your machine. Did, Did it have any effect on the Israeli? What? Did it have any effect on the Israeli computer industry? That later developed. Well, everybody, the, the contact with computers they got at Whitehead didn't have any effect on the computer industry. Um, yes, it familiarized people with, with, with the use of it. You know. uh, the army felt a, a need for for a computer, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and they felt it, and they saw that if they had a computer, there were people here who, who knew about it. Who, Operate and run it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had a um, uh, spent a lot of time. Now here there are three Israel something. People say you built the white sex. Why don't you build a dozen white sex and sell them? Things. This this theme mm -hmm. uh, came about with white sex and, and and with Golan. And we spent a lot of effort in committees. Who would buy it? Who the customers? And uh, Amos de Shalit pressed uh, this idea of. Producing uh, replicas uh, of the Golan, but nothing can mm -hmm. right now. What do you have to say about that? Yeah. Uh, well, on the Golan, we 
There is a number, there is um, Shmir said if we get six, I believe it was six or five orders, orders then we will build them, go to maze. And uh, we just, uh, we got only one or two. <laughs> <laughs> and that was that. The market didn't respond, they really... And you wouldn't have been able to do it competitively, I don't think. Just as the same way now, you, you can't, the United States well, can't compete with Japan because it's another whole ball of wax to produce something and documentation and everything I, is a product. So I, don't know, I don't do. know, I don't know. And I don't know if you could have done it for the right price. Years then. I... We wouldn't have made it that much 60s. profit. We wouldn't have made any 64. profit. <laughs> we were willing to sell at cost price, really. The, the prices that, uh, mm. that Schmiel figured were really yeah. cost price. No, they, they were too, I think. But there is, there is of course, all this um, um, maintenance support, programming support, okay. and all this uh, promised people. IBM promises people to take them by the hand and lead them through this labyrinth. We might have given people the computer, but they would have to do the work they learn <coughs> well enough to maintain it and program it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, really? Well, I have to go to town at 7 o'clock and meet somebody. So if you don't want to go for that, would you like to come to we're gonna have lunch with me or dinner with Nancy and Moshe Yahoo? You're welcome to join us. No, I think I had a heavy lunch today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you didn't even eat now, what happens tomorrow? Tomorrow the golem uh, people. What time do you know?